can seal it, seal it for thy courts of down, dries each tear, holds my hand when I can't stand on my own. Faithful seems to end. Welcome face, sweet embrace, tender touch filled with grace. Faithful love, endless power, living flame, spirit's fire, burning bright in the night, guiding my way. Faithful
Please turn to Isaiah 52, verse 13. Isaiah 52 began reading at verse 13 into chapter 53 through verse 3. Isaiah 52, verse 13 through Isaiah 53 and verse 3. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man, and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths at him, for what had not been told them they will see. What they had not heard, they shall consider. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he will grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. When they see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Let's pray. Almighty God and Heavenly Father, what a beautiful day you've blessed us with. We thank you for the blessings that are in it. And Father, for the, even the troubles that we have, we thank you for those as well, for they teach us that that we can be a more endurant people if we will endure the troubles and trials of life. Father, they're not easy. We know your son knew that well. As, this, as Isaiah wrote, his visage was marred more than any. And when we look upon what happened to our Savior, we wonder why you would even do that. But as Dottie Rambo wrote, the song before we prayed and read, that's love. If that's not love, then the ocean is dry. There's no stars in the sky and the sparrow can't fly. If that isn't love, then heaven's a myth. There's no feeling like this if that isn't love. Father, thank you for your demonstration of love. And as we partake of the body, in our minds, it's the body of Christ. Help us to remember that when we are broken, you're the only one that can mend us. Please forgive us of our sins, and it's in Jesus we pray. Amen. Father, our minds go back to that cross when Jesus suffered six hours one Friday. When he died, he didn't suffer as much as the other thieves because they were getting ready to break his legs, but nonetheless, he suffered immensely. When that Roman soldier took that spear and pierced his side, blood and water came forth. And as John, the apostle John writes, that and the Holy Spirit all agree that they are one. We realize that life's in the blood. And Jesus said, if you thirst, he has water, everlasting water that you can drink. He is the bread of life. And Father, help us to remember not only how fortunate we are, but to examine our own lives to see how we're doing in Christ Jesus according to the scriptures. 
and that we will make those necessary adjustments before it's eternally too late. Help us to take advantage of what you have paid for. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen. take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 16. I want to remind you of what we looked at last week. Is the church essential? Our governor said churches are not essential. I spoke to our state senator Friday, and he said that he didn't know that the governor still forbids us from singing. He said, they are still singing. And I said, well, do I do what God says to do or do I do what the governor says to do? And I kind of like what I heard is happening at a congregation in East Central New Mexico. What they do is they do Praise and Harmony TV like we have, and they turn it up as loud as they've got it. There's no song leader up there. If you want to sing with the presentation, we can't stop you. Well, I, I don't know if I agree with all of that, but what I do know is that the Lord provides the church. In fact, look at chapter 16, verse 13 through 19. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, and I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. 
whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Unfortunately, what people have done, and sometimes we are guilty of it in the church too, and that is we've said that the church is a building. That it's this, these four walls that are surrounding me right now. It's, the, it's a, a particular physical place. Well, that's not the Bible. The Bible says the church is made up of people, Christian people who are collectively the temple of God. And we know that the temple of God will end up in heaven. Well, one of the things that's hard for people to understand, and I know some Christians that don't believe this, the church is a kingdom. The religious world still thinks, the majority of the religious world, I should say, still thinks that the kingdom prophesied back in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7, is still coming. I've been told that they're going to build, they're building a temple in Jerusalem right now. They are building a great big throne for Jesus to sit on. Well, what does the Bible say? And where is Jesus now? He's sitting on his throne at the throne at the right hand of the Father's throne. If he has all power and all authority, Matthew 28 and verse 18, he must have a throne. And of course, he's doing this according to his father's will. And so the church is the kingdom already in existence today. Now, how do we know that? Well, Matthew chapter 3, verse 2, Matthew 4, verse 17, Matthew 10 and verse 7 all say the same thing. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That kingdom is the church. In fact, Jesus spoke from his day that it is at hand. It is near, Mark says. And unfortunately, people think that when Jesus said that, that it's still coming. No, it's in existence today. If it's not in existence today, then why did Jesus say what he said in Matthew 6 and verse 33? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, what is he talking about in the context of these things be added to you? Have you ever worried? Don't answer that question because I'm just as guilty as you are. But there are things that people worry about they, they shouldn't be worrying about, especially Christian people. God knows what we need before we ask or think, Matthew 10, 19. And if he knows what we ask, think or need and we ask him, these things will be added to us. We were cleaning out a friend of mine's in a place down in Lordsburg, and I kept hearing him say something that I said here when we cleaned this building out. I didn't think there was this much stuff in the place. And one of my favorite commercials is the Rubbermaid commercial a few years ago where there was stuff everywhere. And they went to wherever they bought all these Rubbermaid tubs and they shoved everything in these tubs, shoved them under couches, shoved them under beds, shoved them in closets. And the first thing they turned around and said, we need more stuff. And I'm screaming, no, that was the whole point to get rid of the stuff. <laughs> in other words, God's blessed us, hasn't he? We sometimes get what we don't have and we magnify that instead of the stuff we do have. My youngest brother, and I were at the John Deere house in Altus, Oklahoma, and he saw this toy tractor. Now, we were farmers, and so he really liked tractors, and so did I. And we're sitting there, and he wants this tractor, and Dad says, no, you can't have it. Well, he starts throwing a fit. Well, I'm trying to help Dad. And, he, and I said, Christopher or Eric, you have... 13 or 14 out in the yard. Of course, I know that was a little exaggeration. But he understood where I was coming from, and I still can remember his words. But, Dwayne, I need that tractor. Well, you know he didn't need that tractor. 
And yet, what do we magnify as adults? What we don't have sometimes instead of what we do have. Matthew 13, when you look at that whole chapter, some argue that that's the center of Matthew. And he talks about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. The kingdom of heaven is like a rich man who sold, or like a, like a man who sold everything and bought a pearl of great price. And you can read all of those things. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is those things. Well, if Jesus said the kingdom is going to exist, then he must mean that the kingdom of heaven exists today. Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And we know from Colossians 1.13 and 14, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He's conveyed us. Now, who are the us? Those are Christians. Those are people who belong to Christ. Those are the ones who have submitted their lives to Christ. And it is God who has made all of this possible. Here's the problem. The kingdom is the church. That's not a problem for us. The problem we have is that the church is not a democracy. Now, we live in the United States, and whether or not you want to argue with me that we have a representative democracy, which that's what we do have, a republic, or we have a democracy, or, or whatever, well, I'm willing to debate with you on that anytime. The church doesn't fit that category. And unfortunately, the religious world thinks that the church is a democracy. That, you know, for example, uh, Jesus said, what do you do with your enemies? Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 to 43. What do you do with your enemies? Well, I know what Jesus said. You bless them. You don't curse them. When they do something to you, you don't do things spitefully. But see, I just don't agree with that. And, and, and the Lord and I talked about that. And the Lord said, I'm exempt from that rule. Well, that's a lie. That's a crock, as I would say, because the church is a monarchy. There's only one king. James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12 says there's one lawgiver and one judge. Now, we know from 1 Timothy 1, 17, Paul says, Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, to God who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy 6.15 says, which he will manifest in his own time, he who is the blessed and only potentate, the king of kings and lord of lords. So this king makes sure that his rules are known. They're written in this book right here. I tell people frequently, when I preach, don't take my word for it. Look it up. They think they're insulting me by doing that. I think they insult me if they don't do it because I make mistakes as I did Wednesday night, and I'll correct that, Lord willing. And, but this king has written rules. They are in his word. For example, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees had, had taken the law, and what they had done is they said, now, if you say anything twice, and so Jesus uses their wording. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Now verse 22 and 23 refer to the fact what pe some people think. They think that God owes them salvation because they have done something good. We we classify. Let me let me let me read it to you the way Jesus said it. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And many are going to say to me on that day, Lord, haven't we prophesied in your name? Haven't we cast out demons in your name? Haven't we done many wonders in your name? And then I'm going to say to them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Now, let me 2020 it. 
Now, do you know how many times that I was at church? Do you know how many times I opened my Bible and read it? Do you know how many times I prayed? Now, God, you owe me salvation. And the only thing God owes us is eternal destruction and hell. But what he wants to do is give us eternal life. For example, in worship, John 4, 24, God is spirit. And those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I've seen people in the religious world who, who do what they want, and they think God's going to accept it. And they act like uh, the, the dog on Bugs Bunny when Marlon the Martian was trying to blow up the earth. And the dog says, you're going to take it or I'm going to shove it down your throat. Well, they think that they're going to shove these things down God's throat. And God's not going to put up with it. In fact, if you refer back to Isaiah chapter 1, what's the first thing God called them on the carpet about? What was the first thing God got on his people's case about the worship. They weren't worshiping him as he wanted. And yet the people were reacting to Isaiah and Jeremiah like, why are you, why are you doing this? We've never had a better time. The economy is good. We've never had a more peaceful time. Everything's going wonderful and great. God says, no, it's not because you haven't done what I want you to do. And as we quoted a while ago, James 4, 11 and 12, there's only one Lord, one lawgiver, excuse me. There's only one judge. Now, does that mean that we can't pass sentence on someone? And what I mean by that is, if, if was I wrong when my children would tr almost run into a wall and I'd tell them, no, don't do that, don't go that way? Well, according to some people, yes, I was. But my daughter and my son didn't run into that wall because they listened to me. They might have taken it the wrong way temporarily, but I love them dearly. God is no different. He wants what's best for us. And yet people sometimes get the mistake that the church is not a monarchy. The church is a monarchy. It has only one king and he makes the rules. And so the kingdom of heaven is on earth. That's the church. will combine with the kingdom of in heaven. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, God has made everything possible. He's done everything he can to save you and me. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says, nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And I don't care what TV preacher says, what he says. I don't care what any preacher says. The Bible is right. And that includes this preacher. The Bible is always right. Now, Peter, in the, we call them the Christian graces. I don't know who coined that phrase, but it seems to fit pretty well. I'd like to give the person credit. But he talks about add to your faith, virtue to virtue knowledge, and you go on. Peter said, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you'll never stumble. Well, why do we stumble? Because we don't always do what those Christian graces tell us to do. Well, Peter says, for so an everlasting entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want you to picture with me a wedding that you've been to. Now, I've been told that the average wedding in the United States costs somewhere around $27,000. I promise you, our wedding was not $27,000, but it still cost us some money. It took a lot longer for my wife to get ready than it did me, but I can still remember my cousin 
going around and getting as nervous as he could be. He, he just seemed to just, the, the longer the day went, the more nervous he got and the close to seven o'clock, he just got so nervous. And uh, he, he kept telling my, my fiance, now wife at the time, aren't you nervous? Aren't you nervous? She says, I wasn't nervous until we started down the aisle and all those people were around. And she says, why aren't you nervous? Why weren't you nervous? And I said, because I stand up in front of people all the time and talk. <laughs> Can you just imagine what this wedding is going to be like? If Ephesians 5, to 32 is correct, the church is the bride of Christ. Can you imagine what this wedding is going to be like? This wedding ceremony, go to Revelation 19, and I want you to start reading with me at verse 1. After these things, I heard a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power belong to the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, because he's judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants shed by her. Again they said, Alleluia. Her smoke rises up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sat on the throne saying, Amen, Alleluia. Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, and those who fear him, both small and great. And I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude as the sound of many waters, as the sound of the mighty thundering saying, Alleluia. For the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he said to me, Write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage of the supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, See that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Would you please turn over to chapter 21? And I want to just give you a glimpse of what this marriage is going to be. When, when finally Jesus comes and takes his home, this is going to be the consummation of the marriage. And I want you to see with me, oh, heaven's going to be an awesome place. Revelation 21, verse 1. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. Also, there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they'll be his people. God himself will be with them, and they will and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There'll be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he, sat, he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it's done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who comes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. This is the second death. I, I know that you want to go home. My grandma, when she died, right before she died, kept saying a phrase that she used before. She, they found her on the floor down at her house about 10 miles from one of my aunts in Kirkland, and she never got to go back to Kirkland again. But she would tell her family, she'd tell me, she'd tell uh, my mother, and she'd tell my aunt and, and my cousin, I want to go home. 
I want to go home. So one day they had her up and they had her walking and she didn't really want to get up and walk, but she did. When she did, she kept saying, I got to go lay down. My head hurts. They tried to get her to walk a little further and she collapsed on them. They got her to the bed and the ambulance came and picked her up. My mother never got to see her before she died right then. But my aunt said the last word she said were it was, I want to go home. Well, it may sound quaint. It may sound a little strange. And it may sound cliche-ish, but Dorothy was right in the movie, The Wizard of Oz. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. And the kingdom of heaven will be at home. The church will be at home with the one who died for her, bought her, redeemed her, and wants her to live in eternity with him. First John 3 is one of my favorite passages, verse 3 verses. Behold what manner of love the Father has lavished upon us, that we should be called the children of God. And it's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we will see him just as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. Well, one must be added to this kingdom. I'm down at the cafe one day and a friend of mine, we've been trying to, to bring him to Christ. And he looked at me and he said, preach, I'm not gonna join anything else. I said, those are like words to my ears, like music to my ears. And he said, why? And I said, cause you can't join the church. Well, you thought I'd lost my mind. He said, what do you mean by that? I said, you have to be added to the church. In other words, God gives that approval. Matthew 25, verse 46, Jesus said, these will go into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Well, how do I have life? Well, there's four examples in the book of Acts, and I might have missed one or two, so, but they all are going to teach the same thing. But they demonstrate how one is, is saved. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38 to 47, we know Peter told them when, when they asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? He said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is given to you, to your children, to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. You can read Acts 8, verses 26 to 40, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. You can read Acts chapter 9, verses 1 to 15, and Acts 22, verses 13 to 16, the conversion of who we know as the Apostle Paul. And you read about the, Cornea, the conversion of Cornelius, but they're all, they all have the same thing. You got to hear the word. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing the word of God. You got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. John 8, 24, if you do not believe I'm he, you'll die in your sins. You got to repent. What did Peter just tell us? Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Luke 13, 3 and 5 said, do you think that they were worse sinners because they had their blood mixed with Galileans? Jesus says, I tell you, no, but except you repent, you'll all likewise perish. We've got a confessing before men. Matthew 10, 32 and 33 said, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father who is in heaven. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father who is in heaven. We got to be immersed in water. We call that baptism. First Peter, Peter 3.21 says, baptism saves us. Now for me, I've done all of that. For 99% of the people in the, uh, that, that I know, they've done this. This last one is the one that Satan tries everything he can for me not to live faithfully. He worked hard on my heart last night, as a matter of fact, to do something I shouldn't do. And fortunately, I kept praying about it and kept playing with other things to distract me, so to speak. And I'm glad I didn't. Doesn't mean I'm perfect. Doesn't mean I don't fall for it. But what does the Bible say in Revelation 2 and verse 10? He's about to throw some of you into prison, the devil. And you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful to death. And I'll give you the crown of life. 
Now, sometimes we think that 10 days is literal. I used to be guilty of that. But think about it. These people under Rome were losing their lives to the Colosseum, losing their lives to the government, losing their lives to gladiators, losing their lives to animals. And yet, God still told them, Jesus still says, be faithful to death, and I'll give you the crown of life. Well, I've done all that, Dwayne, and yeah, let's go back to that last one. You see, um, Jackie, Wanda, Adele, Brianne, you see, uh, he can save you. You know, it doesn't matter how bad you've done. It doesn't matter what you've done. But you see, your sin just can't be as bad as mine. My, your sin just can't be as horrible as mine. And you see, I, I've went to God to and repented. I've went to God and confessed it. I've went to God and, and asked for strength and wisdom. But you see, I, I know he'll forgive your sins. But you see, he won't forgive mine. Oh, really? Did he lie in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 through chapter 2 and verse 2? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Christ his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we, we, we deceive ourselves, and the truth's not in us. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, we make God out to be a liar, and his word's not in us. My brethren, if any of you sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, who is the propitiation for our sins, but not for our sins only, but for the entire world. You see, that word advocate is a defense attorney. And you see, we need a great defense attorney. Johnny Cochran has nothing on our defense attorney. F. Lee Bailey had nothing on our defense attorney. There is no defense attorney that has any record close to our defense attorney. I'm talking about Jesus, and he's never lost a case. I want you to see this next clip. It'll try to illustrate what, what we've been trying to say. That is, Jesus paid our debt. He wants us to be a part of his kingdom because he wants us all to go home. Photographs and memories are all Tanner Brownlee has left of his dad. The Weld County deputy was killed in the line of duty nearly five years ago. Tonight, he had the chance to get one of his dad's prized possessions. But as 7 News reporter Marshall Zellinger saw firsthand, it didn't work out as Tanner had planned. So this is your dad holding you when you were first born. Tanner Brownlee has memories of his dad all over his house. And this flag was flown over the White House. His dad, Sam, was a Weld County Sheriff's deputy killed in the line of duty after a police chase in 2010. This means so much to me, um, just because he used to motorcycle all the time. He was given his dad's motorcycle jacket the day he died. Just everything I can get means a lot to me. The jacket doesn't fit, and Tanner wants something of his dad's that does. It mean a lot to me and my brother. We... We've been through a lot. 5,000, now 7,500. 5, now 75, we do 5, 5, 5, 75. 7,500, now 10,000. The Weld County Sheriff's Office is auctioning his dad's retired squad car. I think I'm just going to look around, see what everyone else is doing, try to copy them. So just up them by one. The Dodge Charger, with 147,000 miles, is valued at 12,500. 12 and a half, now 15, now 17 and a half. But for Tanner, it's worth so much more. 45, now 50, who do we 50? Thank you very much. More than he could afford at the auction. Tanner's limit had come and gone. 60 now, 62 and a half. Y'all done? Sold it your way, Mr. Steve Wells. Thank you very much. $60,000. And so had his dad's car. Or so he thought. Tanner, here's your car. A stranger just bought Tanner his dad's car. Thanks a lot, man. You had no idea that that guy in the back was bidding and then going to hand you the key. Nope, I shook his hand and I didn't know. <laughs> this is kind of the end of Sam's legacy here. Uh, it's the last tangible thing we have that he was connected to. And, and now Deputy Sam Brownlee's car is back where it belongs, home. No donuts. Uh, I no don't donuts. Want, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> With photojournalist James Doherty in Greeley, Marshall Zellinger, 7 News. You see, we're Tanner. 
Jesus is Steve. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid all our debts to God. And what he asked in return is simple obedience. you for the day in which you've given to us again. Father, we thank you for another day to praise and worship you. And Father, as Brother Phil talks on the search program, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that's what we've done thus far with worship. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of having technology to do these things. And Father, there's so many that are, are so confused about what's going on in our world and it's easy to get distracted thinking you've lost control, but we know you're in absolute control because you're gonna destroy this world one day because it's yours. It's yours to destroy. And Father, we thank you through your grace, mercy, and love that you haven't destroyed us yet, that this nation is still the greatest nation in the world, but Father, we pray for it. Because there are things she's doing that we're not pleased with and we know you're not either. Leaders are acting like little brats. Father, we, we pray that, that somehow or another they can get the message that they need to grow up. Father, we just thank you that, that we have a word that we can turn to that can also correct us and clean us up. Father, again, for those that are sick with, with coronavirus and other viruses, we pray for them. Pray they'll get better. For those who've lost loved ones because of the COVID-19, we lift them up to you. For those that are dealing with it in doctor's offices and hospitals and, and the like, we just, we pray for them as well. Father, for our police officers, all lives matter. We thank you that they serve us. And Father, sometimes one bad apple ruins the whole barrel. Help us to remember that, Father, that not everybody is that way. And Father, we just thank you that we have a, a Savior who reminds us of how we're to behave. Please forgive us when we have failed you. Thank you for that Savior going to the cross who was our and is our mediator. Thank you, Father, for the one who's went behind the veil and tore it down. That, Father, we can come to you anytime we want. Father, for those that still need our prayers today, we lift them up to you. We thank you for those who were ill and are doing better. We, we pray for those who've lost loved ones like the Christophers and, and the Brannons. And, and Father, we just pray that you'll help us to be the way we're supposed to be. 
Please forgive us of our sins. It's in Jesus we pray. Amen.